I'm Tawny Bloom, and I'm a member of the National Patient Advisory Committee, um, and I uh, um, advocate for people with hepatic encephalopathy. I um, had, was diagnosed with PSC in 1997 when I was 18 years old, and then in 2010, I was diagnosed with PBC, or primary biliary cholangitis. And um, I was lucky enough to receive 64% of my sister's liver five years ago um, as a living donor. So I'm lucky to not have to deal with that stuff anymore. Um, but I wanna thank Dr. Bajaj to, for being with us today. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, Tony, and thank you to the ALF for, for bringing us together and having this strong advisory uh, uh, panel. Uh, and advocacy for patients uh, for, for yourself and many others who are suffering. I'm uh, Jasmohan Bajaj. I'm a professor of medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University and the Richmond VA Medical Center in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, if you say one of my life's passions and work is to actually solve and help patients with hepatic encephalopathy to find out what the gut brain axis is and actually go right from the patient to the microbes to the brain level to help everyone concerned. Uh, with this disorder. Well, thank you. Um, and what we'll do today is I'll just ask you a few questions, um, of questions we receive from other patients or family members that um, are dealing with hepatic encephalopathy. And just so everybody knows too, I'll refer to it as HE, um, just so there's that understanding as well. Um, so when does hepatic encephalopathy typically arise? And um, can HE occur in the earlier stages of liver disease than cirrhosis? So HE typically occurs in patients with cirrhosis, most likely in whom have those, uh, it, it, either the disease is very advanced or the collaterals, which means the veins that drain the blood from the bowels, mix with the drain, blood uh, that, is, uh, is in, that reaches our brain without going through the liver first. So the filtering ability of the liver is either reduced or is non-existent because the blood bypasses. It can happen very rarely in people even without cirrhosis, but if you are feeling confused and you don't have cirrhosis, there could be also many other reasons that can cause confusion or slowing. And it is quite likely that your primary care physician and your hepatologist and potentially a neurologist may be able to get to the bottom of all of that. Okay. Um, and how is hepatic encephalopathy measured in patients with liver failure? And is it possible that a brain can, scan can pick it up? So this is a very interesting question. There are many ways of measuring the extent of hepatic encephalopathy. It is very difficult to say, yes, this person has HE. You have to basically exclude everything else and ensure that this person has HE if there's nothing else that is positive in someone who is who has cirrhosis and has problems. Uh, there is no diagnostic criteria as such, and I think we're going to talk about it later. Ammonia is not very useful in one specific uh, instance uh, to actually uh, take care of HE. You want to take the whole global picture of the person. And once we've diagnosed it, we want to see how bad it is, how whether someone is near coma, whether someone is able to function themselves, or and to also find out what is causing that encephalopathy to happen. More often than not, it is something else like an infection or a bleeding from the bowels or some electrolyte problems caused by diuretics or et cetera that can cause the encephalopathy to happen. So our main focus is to find out whether someone has encephalopathy, how bad it is, what is the precipitating factor that causes the encephalopathy to appear and to finally treat it. And all four of these have to go hand in hand to make sure that we give the best care possible to the patients. I remember when I knew I had an infection when my age got really bad too, so yeah. Um, and how reliable are the ammonia blood levels? I know you talked a little bit about that. Um, and are the ammonia levels checked with normal liver panel blood work? So I'll ask, answer the second question first. They are not checked with normal uh, ammonia blood work because it, it has to be drawn, put on ice, gone to the lab Im almost immediately. Within 30 minutes, it has to go. So it's a big uh, ask for someone if we don't really follow the ammonia levels. Are ammonia levels reliable? Not really. In patients with cirrhosis, they're not reliable. 
what we do is we use our judgment, use a history, talk to the family members, talk to the patient, look at the chart, make sure there's nothing else going on, and then treat patients with encephalopathy and look for precipitating factors. Ammonia levels are a very, very minuscule part of this entire spectrum of evidence that we use to either rule in or rule out patients with hepatic encephalopathy. We use ammonia levels to conceptualize to the patients. Maybe your ammonia is rising, that's why you're feeling slow. That does not mean that there is a direct correlation with what is happening in your blood ammonia with what is happening in someone's brain. So in short, ammonia levels are an imperfect way of defining how bad someone is feeling. And as always, as doctors, we want to treat the patient and not a test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely important to track those um, symptoms that they're seeing at home to be able to report to the doctor. Yes. So yeah. Okay. And then this person's question, they have the hepatic encephalopathy symptoms, um, but the ammonia levels aren't significantly elevated. Um, and are there other tests that they or their family member can do at home, like the flap test or anything? So actually, I realized I forgot to answer the brain scan question because this oh, can, yeah. encephalopathy cannot be reliably diagnosed using a brain scan. In a regular scan, very special functional MRI scans that we and others have published on as far as research studies can do that. But clearly, when it talks, when we need urgent attention for a patient, no one is going to order a brain scan to diagnose HE. It is to exclude other things like strokes or trauma, etc., but clearly not to diagnose it. And if someone has a normal ammonia level, but is feeling fatigued and feeling tired and has all the symptoms of HE, most often than not, we will treat them as HE. At home, if you're feeling bad and if you think you might have HE, the first thing you need to do is to contact your provider, either telephonically or by video, which is preferable because then we can see what is happening with you and your family members. And if you don't feel comfortable, have your family member dis define what's happening. And more often than not, more than 95% of the time, we take the patient and the family member's word as gospel. That's what is driving our treatment of the patient. Everything else, ammonia levels, et cetera, et cetera, are all very secondary. The flaps only happen in relatively later stages of the disease. So if, if we don't really rely on that, and especially when someone is a non-medical uh, 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 evaluator, we don't do that, which is why video is good because then your provider can actually see what is happening. The other things we typically do is we ask patients about their quality of life and we ask them about to do certain tests. One test is called the animal naming test. In one minute, name all the animals that you, different animals that you can possibly write down. And if it's above 15, you're okay. If it's less than 15, chances are likely there's something not right at that point. The other thing is called the Encephal app, which is a Stroop app that is downloadable in iOS and Android. Uh, if you download that and you can actually do that as well. But the question is, none of these will take the place of you actually reaching out or you or your family member reaching out to someone because not only we want to diagnose it, we actually want to treat it. And as you said, we want to find out what's behind this episode, not just the episode itself. Is there an infection that is going on? Is there some, some medications of, that are dehydrating the patient that we need to fix? All of those things to me are very much more important than actually figuring out at that point what's going to happen because the course can be very unpredictable. Some people can be not so confused right now and two hours later, they may be found lying flat in bed. That's something that we want to make sure that both the patients know, the caregivers know, and they have a direct line to someone who is medically trained to figure this out. Yeah, that's, it's so important that um, the families and caregivers know all the signs and symptoms so they're not just um, thinking the person's sleeping and, you know, they can assess the situation. Okay. Um, and then this person um, has HE and has been hospitalized multiple times due to high ammonia level. Um, and they take the appropriate amount of lactulose um, that the doctor is prescribing, um, but it doesn't seem to be helping and it's definitely affecting the quality of life um, negatively. Um, and what can be done to prevent future hospitalizations um, due to hepatic encephalopathy episodes? 
In the United States, we have a medication called rifaximin, which is taken 550 milligrams twice a day. And that adds to the lactulose's ability to prevent hospitalizations. And that has been clearly proven by multiple studies here and around the world. If rifaximin also does not help, then we come to a crossroads. Does this person really have HE or is there something else going on underneath? Or is there some shunts? Remember when we first talked about it, we were talking about the uh, blood from the bowels being shunted away from the liver, directly going to the systemic circulation where it hits the brain. In patients who are not responding to lactulose and rifaximin, then we look, we do a CAT scan or an MRI of the belly to see if those shunts are available, are present. And if there's a large shunt in someone whose otherwise liver function is not that bad, we can ask our interventional radiology colleagues to actually block them so that the blood then is forced to go through the liver again and the liver is at least able to filter some of it. So there are many other techniques that we can apply, but the first line here is to make sure they're taking lactulose appropriately and also to start rifaximin. These are very challenging drugs to take, especially lactulose is very difficult. I was just gonna say that's the worst part of it, but for me, it really helped. I mean, I found a good combination. Um, and just a side note, blue Gatorade works really well with lactulose. Okay, <laughs> it's good to know. And you know, this is so important because we ask people to share parts of their lives that we normally is not normally social conversation. Now, how many bowel movements did you have yesterday? Do you ask that even to the patient, people you're closest, uh, short of your you know, children? You don't really ask that of people, <laughs> how many bowel movements you have today. And now suddenly family members are thrust into this role of asking these awkward questions because they can mean the dif difference between someone being found flat in their bed versus someone actually doing their, uh, whatever needs to be done. So these awkward conversations need to be happen, need to be, um, it need to take place before the patient is discharged from the hospital and yeah. reiterated and, you know, multiple times because this is important to ask these awkward questions to prevent hospitalization. Get it out of the way and talk about it and just be comfortable with it. <laughs> All right. Um, and unfortunately, I know the answer to this question, but um, does the severity of hepatic encephalopathy influence a patient's MELD score? The answer is no. And therefore, there could be a, a universe of suffering that is not captured by a MELD score, which means, as you know, the MELD score is what determines whether you get transplanted today, whether you get transplanted later, or whether you get transplanted at all. So that is why we want to focus on all the measures that we just talked about beforehand so that until and unless you get a MEL score that is high enough in your region to get an organ, you, the patients feel better, the family members feel better, and they all feel that they have efficacy, self-efficacy, which means the ability to deal with this disease on their own or know enough to know when is the time to involve others. So that is something that we as doctors and as NPs and as PAs and all the providers have to actually listen to the patients and caregivers, talk to them and see what they want because everyone's situation is different. Everyone has a different person who will be playing watch over them and everyone has a different uh, uh, suffering level. So right now, unfortunately, it doesn't uh, affect the MEL score. Yeah, I, um, that was one of the things, the, my negative quality of life because of the HE um, helped me be, qualify for the living donor transplant just because I was so bad with it. Yes. Yeah, and, and as, as you said, it's different for living donor transplant. Mm -hmm. Like you had, you, you're like a sister and you were lucky enough to go through. Uh, whereas, but what I'm talking about is the deceased donor transplant, right. which is... So obviously the MELD score and HE and quality of life can be major factors when it comes to living donor transplant. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and will confusion be present after transplant? And if so, how long? So the short answer is very rarely. If someone is has HE, multiple episodes of HE before transplant, the chances are their brain recovery might be slightly more delayed than the other people. There can be other reasons for confusions after transplant, infections, medications, the usual things. Remember, you've gone through a major life-changing surgery. 
even people who have an eight hour surgery without any underlying liver disease can have several complications, including brain complications. But is there a rule of thumb that someone who goes in with HE will definitely have HE or some kind of residual things afterwards? The answer is no. So almost all people recover. The extent to which they recover is variable, but it is clearly enough for them to do all their activities of daily living that and be relatively independent uh, and actually um, completely independent after the transplant because that goes into the calculus that we do along with uh, the transplant committees to decide it's not just the uh, you know the liver part we want to make sure that the entire person is being considered when we talk about transplant listing eligibility and continued candidacy for those patients and you've kind of answered this a little bit but um, does HE cause long-term or pre permanent um, damage? It can if it is actually left untreated for a very long time. And by long-term damage, I don't mean that the patients get demented or confused constantly. But what I meant, people become slower and slower and slower. So what we want to do in those patients who had multiple episodes of encephalopathy, like one of the uh, questioners actually answer, asked us, we want to break the cycle and break the cycle very quickly because either start them on rifaximin, find out if there's a precipitating factor that no one has picked up on yet and find out if they, they have those shunts that need to be blocked because clearly multiple episodes do lead to some kind of cognitive damage but it is, uh, it's rarely to the point where people are not being able to function on their own. And hopefully people will get listed for liver transplant or whatever is causing their cirrhosis can be fixed. Uh, you know, if they have hepatitis B, it can be suppressed. If it's hepatitis C, that can be eradicated. Hopefully if they have some other kind of conditions like you know, alcohol that we can help them stop drinking. These are all the things that go hand in hand in treating the complication of the disease. You also have to go back and find out what was causing the disease and put all of this in one perspective that is individualized for that one person. And so no one size fits all, but clearly there are some rules of thumb that we actually go, go by. Uh, and it always involves listening to the patients and the family members. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you um, talking with me today. And um, I know AG, like I've said a couple of times, has really affected my life and um, those that um, my caregivers as well. And I know a lot of people out there are suffering, suffering with complications from AG, from liver disease. And um, it's so important that we get the information out there because um, I feel like AG is not talked about enough and not everybody knows about it. And I wish we knew about it um, earlier on in my um, history with liver disease. So thank you so much. And thank you to ALF as well for letting us have this conversation today and um, for getting the word out. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you to ALF again.